maybe it would make sense for America to actually leapfrog places like Europe and Canada and go for all out legalization. And uh, we were, Nick, Nick was sharing this piece with me earlier uh, by the late uh, Dan Baum uh, in Harper's Magazine called Legalize It All. And um, I thought this could be a, a way to kick off this conversation. Um, he writes that just about everybody who thinks seriously about the end of drug prohibition agrees that we'll want to discourage consumption. Um, I mean, that we can put that aside for a second, but the goal could be accomplished, uh, at least in part, under a system of regulated for-profit stores by setting limits on advertising and promotion for banning them or banning them altogether, by preventing marketing to children, by establishing minimum distances from schools for retail outlets, by nailing down the rules about dosage and purity, and by limiting both the number of stores and their hours of operation. And so Baum here is basically proposing treat these hypothetical all you can buy drug stores the same way you might treat a highly regulated liquor store does that strike you as a plausible and good model well i mean first of all politically i think it's neither here nor there i just don't see the support i mean you know, as, as we pointed out before zach even as the numbers rose for marijuana legalization and now on psychedelics, we're not seeing the same type of change. I think the one the country that comes closest to be open to that sort of model may be Switzerland, actually, where the numbers have been, you know, 35, 40 percent in the past. But even there, they're accustomed to having a fairly hyper regulatory system. And so they might and they've had a lot of success in varying ways with that sort of system. There's a greater cultural tolerance for it. In the United States, we don't have the kind of tolerance for those sorts of models. I mean, periodically we had, you know, post-prohibition with states having, you know, liquor monopolies and things like that. But it, it's not the kind of thing that one can see really working in America where we tend to veer between moralistic prohibitionist extremes on the one hand or like let it all roll. You know, like, you know, you look at European, they want to legalize gambling. They still, you know, the casinos are regulated. They, you know, the, the, the state lottos and all this are thing. In the United States, when we go from prohibition to legalization, you know, we start, you know, having casinos open 24-7 with all sorts of incentives to, you know, keep gambling and stuff. And we do start doing lotto and we're hiring ad companies to design ads that specifically appeal to addictive personalities. I mean, so we don't do that middle ground thing. Secondly, I'll tell you, one of my principal ways of, of, of thinking about legalization, it gives me pause, is I think about... You know, what some people would oftentimes describe as the three most powerful, addictive, and omnipresent drugs in human society. And what are those? Sugar, fat, salt. Sugar, fat, salt. Sugar, fat, salt. Right. Now, you look at what sort of multinational food producing companies have been able to do on that front, right, where they're doing stuff with brain chemistry and they're figuring out the exact combinations of the sensual taste in the mouth and the texture and the sugar fat salt combinations, you know, where junk food, not just because of what they're producing, but has become enormously popular in all sorts of ways and appealing. And, you know, it's especially an issue with poorer people. But this is becoming more and more of a universal phenomenon, not just the United States. Right. And you see that obesity, the consequences of obesity, the estimate now is possible that obesity now results in a greater loss of life and of, of, you know, dollars lost than does either smoking or all illicit drugs put together. Right. So and that's happened quite dramatically in the last 20 or 30 years. So if I begin to imagine a legal system where pharmaceutical companies can, um, you know, do what the food companies are doing and sort of be coming up with all sorts of neat drug combinations that specifically generate some level of dependence, but don't do that much harm, at least in the short term. And da, 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 that's my great fear about what could happen there. When I look at a model for legalization, the one that I think comes closest is one that before actually you, sorry, Ethan, before you go on there let me just ask um if that is your fear would that actually be a worse situation than we are in right now given the level of death that is happening from mm -hmm. fentanyl which is the fact that fentanyl is on the streets is purely a byproduct of the black market well so it's a great no that's the right question zach you know yeah. how do we compare these relative risks right and in fact you know 30 years ago i put together a working group at princeton um the princeton working group on uh, on the future of drug use and alternatives to drug prohibition and i published a piece called thinking seriously about alternatives to drug prohibition in the journal the academic journal daedalus 30 years ago mm -hmm. which really hashed out all of these 
you can find it online, but it's, you know, it really hashed out all these issues. How do we balance the competing values at stake, including the question that you just posed, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, is would that in fact, um, you know, solve the federal issue? Um, it might, it might do that. Um, you know, you know, if, if, this, if, if you had asked me the same question four or five years ago, um, or maybe four or five years from now, if the fentanyl issue diminishes a lot, would that change the calculation? But Zach, the thing I would point out is there is actually a model that emerged and was actually enacted into law, but never implemented. Okay. And about 10, 15 years ago, New Zealand had a major problem with synthetic cannabinoids, right? And people were getting in trouble with it. Stores were popping up unregulated. And what eventually happened was the two biggest manufacturers of the synthetic cannabinoids, which was kind of not legally regulated, but not illegal, they approach the government and the health ministry and they say, we have a mutual interest here. We know our products are relatively safe. We've done the testing, but we don't like all these fly by night companies and all these pop up retail outlets. And so, and we have a mutual interest in getting rid of these. So, what they proposed and what New Zealand Parliament enacted with like 110 to one vote was a system setting up basically an FDA like entity that where pharmaceutical companies or anybody could submit a drug that they had created to this new FDA-like entity. And if they could establish a substantial margin of safety, the government would approve it for over-the-counter retail sale to adults, even though it had no accepted medical use. So it was like the FDA thing without requiring medical use, just showing substantial margin of safety. And the people behind that, including in the government, understood that what they were proposing to do for synthetic cannabis might well be a model that could apply more broadly to all other drugs as well. Now, unfortunately, the law was never implemented for ridiculous reasons when people caring about animal rights protested they didn't want to have drugs being tested on animals and the whole thing shut down. But the fact is the drug, that, that law is still on the books. You know, the United Nations Control Board, the Narcotics Control Board, which normally freaks out about any reform, didn't really quite know what to do about it. So I think that's a potential regulatory model which might make a lot of sense. And remember also, it's also about like, if you're going to legalize cocaine, are you going to legalize it only in a kind of cocaine, coca tea version, which has cocaine in it, or mm -hmm. like, you know, chewing gums mm -hmm. and, and sodas, like liquid forms? Are you going to legalize the sale of 10% pure potency powder for snorting? Are you going to allow it to be sold in injectable or smokable forms? Um, if you only allow it to be sold in the less potent forms, um, would you then, uh, you know, crack down on people who are selling it in, you know, who could, you know, turn cocaine that they bought at a pharmacy or a store into crack? Would you then crack down on them for selling it in the pre-made crack forms? So, hmm. I mean, the organization in the UK, uh, Transform, you put up one of their slides before, uh -huh. and their public policy specialist, Steve Rolls, um, um, R-O-L-L-E-S. He was the last of my 80 interviews on my podcast, Psychoactive. He's really done some of the most... Um, you know, advanced thinking on this stuff. He's, I tease him about being sort of a hyper regulator, um, which is true. It's, you know, but he's actually thinking hard about what regulatory models might make sense for what sorts of drugs. And they have a new it, volume that came out in the last year about how to legalize stimulants, which is the hardest, you know, we can figure it out for cannabis, psychedelics, maybe even for opioids, but the stimulant drugs are the ones, the cocaine and methamphetamine are the really, really tricky, challenging ones. You would agree, though, that movements towards, with almost no exceptions, movements towards decriminalization and legalization are to be preferred over the status quo or a rollback of that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, almost totally. I mean, I mean, the, the thing is, look, what I one of the great advantages of legalization to the extent that legalization is synonymous with legal regulation and that's something that some old fashioned yeah. libertarians recoil at. But right, when you right. define legalization as legal regulation, right? You know, one of the arguments I typically made is that people think of prohibition as the ultimate form of regulation, when in fact, prohibition represents the abdication of regulation. Mm -hmm. Anything that's not being effectively prohibited is basically like outside and is totally right. unregulated, controlled by gangsters, criminals, you know. Ba ba ba. So when it means when legalization is synonymous with legal regulation, and when that legal regulation is pragmatic, not overly heavy-handed, not right. not dumb, not which inev inevitably regulations become yeah. dumb and backward in some areas, but where the essence of it is constructive and conforms to local culture, well, I think that is almost always um, a step forward, right? Yeah, we, I, we I don't know. Want, 
you know, underground synthetic drugs being sold. We don't want, you know, the or, latest, you know. Well, you don't want them to be underground, but maybe you want them to be sold. But then the people who sell them, you know, if they're acting in, in open daylight, they can be, you know, they can be found, they can be sued, they can be held responsible. Right. You want civil done. liability. Exactly. Yeah. That's one of the great benefits of a legal regulatory system yeah. is you have civil liability for the harms that are caused. And, right. you know, some synthetic cannabinoids may be perfectly fine, other things. But, you know, the stuff where people are using now with the xylazine, this other mm -hmm. tranquilizer drug out of Colombia that's being mixed with fentanyl and beginning you know, yeah. to merge from Philadelphia, you, you don't want that, all that crap there. You but I, I know what you're saying. There, right? And this goes back to, you know, the kind of Thomas Saws worldview which is beautiful and powerful in its simplicity but you know i when i say you know i would like to live in a world where all drugs are treated like beer wine and alcohol often from my fellow libertarians i'll be told that i'm awful because i'm i'm asking for new taxes you know and new right, regulations right. to be written and it's kind of like yeah i guess so but you know, know. In, in the big picture are you fucking kidding but Nick, um, been a, my perception is there's a substantial evolution in the libertarian, both libertarian, oh, sure. political yeah. and libertarian, uh, you know, where they no longer say prohibition and taxation are the same thing. Where right, there's an understanding. Right. And part of that's political pragmatism, you know, that marijuana yeah. has been such a great success and you realize that has to come. And part of it is a matter that ta the way you tax, how you tax, the levels mm -hmm. you tax make a huge difference. You know, California right. got the taxation system all messed up. There are better and mm -hmm. worse ways to do this stuff. Yeah. And then ultimately prohibition represents its own form of tax and it's well, a far more onerous one thanks for watching that excerpt of a live stream that zach weismuller and i did with ethan nadelman late of the drug policy alliance about legalizing all drugs if you want to watch another excerpt go here if you want to watch the full conversation go here and come back next thursday at 1 p.m eastern time because every week we've got a live stream with another great guest that you're going to be into thanks for watching